I want you to get marked absent because you came here. Okay. As long as you're cool, I'm cool. So today is history of jet engines. How many people in here enjoy history? Stand up. Okay, you don't have to stand up. Three or four, five people raise their hand. Woo! I, I personally, I'm, my two favorite pieces of history are aviation, and I'm weird. I like the, the war, the war in the Pacific during World War II. I'm, I, I was in the Air Force, but most of the war that occurred in uh, World War II in the Pacific was fought by the United States Navy and the United States Marine Corps, and then later towards the end of there. The, the Army Air Corps, which is the predecessor to the, today's Air Force, uh, the Air Force ended up uh, playing a big part in World War II. But second half of this semester, starting in October, you're going to take a two-credit class in aviation history, and you're going get to get to cover some of those reasons why, how, how World War II was won by the United States and its uh, allies, in particular how uh, airplanes played a big part in that. Interestingly enough, jet engines bolted onto airplanes didn't occur until the beginning of World War II. So I'm very interested in the history of jet engines. Uh, I also taught jet engines to people that were going to become pilots at an aeronautical university in Arizona, Embry-Riddle Aeronautic University. I taught there for uh, 12 years. And they had to take, if they were going to be pilots, they had to take a whole college class on jet engines. And so this is literally the lecture that I gave. And they're all juniors. They're all, yeah, most of them are juniors in college is what this lecture is from. So jet propulsion is based on Newton's third law of motion. Has anybody ever heard of Newton's third law of motion? I know there was, I know there was one or two people thinking about taking physics in high school. Did anybody actually take physics? Don't feel... Don't feel bad if you didn't take physics. What's that? For every, yeah, for every movement, there's counteraction. You don't have to write this down yet. But for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Essentially, if I take a, a ball that weighs 10 pounds, let's say it's a, a rock, and I throw it that way, a 10-pound ball, and I get it up to 20 miles an hour, there's a certain amount of energy that's in that ball. If you stood in front of it or that rock and it hit you in the head, it would hurt you a certain amount. But when I throw the ball that way, it pushes me back this way. If I was on, uh, if I had rollerblades on and I threw that ball, I would move this way a little bit. Let's just say I weigh 300 pounds. That's plus or minus a couple of pounds of what I weigh. And I took, you're not laughing about that, okay. And I took, picked up a 300 pound weight and I th pushed that weight on the ground and, it, and I pushed it so it went five miles an hour that way, I would get pushed and I would start moving at five miles an hour in the opposite direction. If I could push 600 pounds in five miles an hour and I weigh 300, I'd push back twice as fast because I'm half as heavy. I'd move faster. So that's what jet engines do. They don't push giant amounts of rocks but they push the air out really, really fast. So if the air comes out one side of the engine, the engine gets pushed in the other direction. So Newton's third, third law, now you can write it down. Newton's third law, come on in, you're in the right place. Right. You looking for uh, your lunch bag? Yeah. Okay, after today it's a dollar. Yeah. Cash in advance, cash in advance. We're gonna, I'm going to split it out across all the students, so I need it all in pennies all right. so I can spread it out. So Newton's third law is for every action, you can write this part down, every action there's an equal but opposite reaction. Another way to write that down is that if I push something in one direction, whatever did the pushing is going to go in the opposite direction. Has anybody, has anybody ever seen a video of a squid swimming around in the ocean? A squid actually squirts water out a tailpipe, if you will, and it moves forward in the opposite direction. So a squid actually has jet propulsion. If you t is A model rocket uses jet propulsion. We call them rockets instead of jets. But a model rocket, it blows hot air out one direction, and the engine goes in the opposite direction. So that's the really, really, really basic theory of how jet engines fly airplanes around is you blow air out the tailpipe going backwards and the airplane goes forward. That's Newton's third law 
of motion. I'm sorry, I know I didn't warn you in advance, but you just learned a little bit of physics. I'm sorry if that bothers you, if you were trying to get through your whole life without ever learning any physics. I'm really sorry about that. So, what I want to do is I want to draw a formula here. Let's see if I can do it. I'm going to write, I'm going to put a triangle here. This is delta. So there's two ways that you can get thrust out of an, en- of an engine. One of them is F is force, and you, a mass of air, that's how much it weighs here on Earth, and you change its velocity. You accelerate it. You make it go faster. You suck it in, but you blow it out the tailpipe faster. And even if it's air, it still has weight. It still has mass. So the formula I've got written there, I couldn't figure out how to get it done in PowerPoint. The way you would read this, you would call this F equals M times delta V. Delta means change. So change in velocity. So I'm going to write an example up here. And I'm going to say the force that a jet engine can generate is equal to the mass or the weight of whatever changes speed times this change in velocity. Or we could say change in velocity. And you're going, yeah, yeah, what in the world does that mean? So let's just say I'm going to accelerate 100 pounds of air, and I'm going to multiply it by its change in velocity. So if the engine's sitting there on the ground, the air out out in front of it, it's not moving at all. If the jet engine's sitting there on the ground, it's not moving at all. So the air starts out at zero, we'll call it miles an hour. So minus zero miles per hour. But if I have a jet engine, and I'll just draw a little jet engine up here, and we suck air in the intake and we blow air out the tailpipe, and we're blowing 100 pounds of air, and let's say we're blowing it out at 500 miles per hour. So we're going to change it. The change in velocity is, and I know it looks like we're writing it backwards, is that it starts out at 100 miles an hour, but it ends up at 500 miles an hour. If we do this subtraction problem, that is the change. That is the delta. So I know this math is going to be really hard, so I'm going to help you out here. So we now have 100 times 500 minus 0. That's going to be tough. 500 minus 0 is 500. 100 times 500. So 100 times 500 is 100. Correction. 500 with two more zeros are in it. So if I draw this up here, I know I'm running out of room here. That's 50,000 pounds of force. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do this math on the test. Is that okay? Okay, because I, I my intent is not for this to be a math class. My intent is for you to start thinking about these basic concepts of how a jet engine works. If you want that jet engine that's bolted to the airplane to go forward, you're going to have to pull in air and then blow it out the tailpipe faster than when it came in. The, and there's two ways. There's, there's, you can either, in this case, you can either change how much air goes through the engine, maybe make a bigger engine, or you could change how fast does it blow it out the tailpipe. So that is, we can change the mass of the air, that's the weight of it, or we can change how much did we change its velocity, how much did we change its speed. Those are the two ways to work this one problem right here. Did I totally lose anybody? Did I partially? It's okay if I partially lost her. All right. Now, there's a second way to get thrust. We can take some air that weighs a certain amount, blow it out the tailpipe faster than it came in. That's force equals uh, change in velocity. And that's Newton's Thurs law. There's another way jet engines generate thrust. 
So let me, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe it before I write it up there, before, before I tell you what that is. Well, here, I'll, I'll put the formula up there because I know you're going to wish you wrote it. And this also has a delta in it. So area, that's like, that, that's like cubic inches. Correction, that's like square inches. So I want you to think about this for a second. If you had uh, a piece of paper that was 12 inches long, we'll make, it, we'll make it a square here, and this paper, don't say it out loud, and it was 12 inches wide, don't tell me, and you drew a line at every inch, and you drew a line at every inch, and you filled this thing up, don't say it out loud, don't say it out loud, don't say it out loud. Don't say the answer out loud. Don't say it out loud. How many square inches? Don't say it out loud. If you had a piece of paper that's 12 inches by 12 inches, and you drew a line, a vertical, a bunch of horizontal lines every inch, and you drew vertical lines every inch, don't say the answer out loud. How many one-inch squares would you have? I know this is difficult if you haven't done it before. And you don't have to write this formula down. Okay, don't write this down. Is area equals the length times the width. And so square inches is an area. So if I wanted to know the square inches here, it's 12 inches long and it's 12 inches wide. And if you got out your calculator, 12 times 12. I went to school a long, long time ago where they made me memorize this. And 12 times 12 is 144. So there would be 144 square inches. If, I'm trying to, gosh, I can't think of a good one. Oh, I can think of one. So a hovercraft is a vehicle, and these seem to be mostly on the water. There's somebody on ice. But underneath that hovercraft, the only thing that's holding it up is air. There's just a cushion of air. It's some, a lot of it's leaking out the bottom. And you have to blow enough pressure in there so that it pushes up on the vehicle the same weight as the vehicle. So if the vehicle weighs 10,000 pounds, I've got to have a force pushing down on the ground 10,000 pounds, which will push back to the tune of 10,000 pounds. If I had 10,000 little squares, 10,000 square inches underneath that thing, you think one of these things has... 10,000 square inches under it. Let's look at this one. There we go. I bet you this is 10,000 square inches. Underneath this whole thing, if we measured the, how many square inches are under it, let's just say the area, if we looked it up, it was a square, and it had 10,000 square inches in an area underneath it. If the air pressure inside of there was only one PSI, one pound per square inch higher than the outside, it would push down on the ground 10,000 pounds, and it would push up on the vehicle 10,000 pounds, and it would hold up a 10,000-pound vehicle. Let's think about that for a second. Has anybody ever put air in a bicycle tire? One person. Yeah, okay. How about put air in an automobile tire? It's more than that. Okay. What's the pressure in car tires, generally? 33 PSI. Yeah. This thing, I only need one PSI. How about bicycle tires? The skinnier the bicycle tire, the higher the pressure. I've got a nice racing bike that if you put a 300-pound person on it, you've got to bump it up to about 100 PSI. Other bicycles may only be 60 or 40 PSI. So one PSI of pressure is not that much. Most people, when you go to your water faucet in your house, that pressure is usually around 40 PSI. Has anybody ever gone outside and turned on the faucet and tried to hold your thumb over the garden hose? Can you hold your thumb over the garden hose when it's wide open? No, nobody has that. Well, maybe, maybe the former governor of California does. I don't know. 
Maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger. I got to come up with who, who's another strong person besides oh the, the Incredible Hulk. Well, he can do anything, right? Oh, hey, oh wait, sorry. He's just pretend, right? Isn't Incredible Hulk? Okay, you think it's pretend? All right. So one psi, you could actually hold your thumb over pretty easy. One psi, you could probably put your mouth to a pressure gauge, and you could probably get that psi to go up to two or three or four psi. So the air doesn't have to move to have pressure. I'm going to say that again. The air doesn't have to move to have pressure. Now this device here, you put in one psi underneath it to push down on the ground and it pushes up with one psi, but one psi times 10,000 is 10,000 pounds. What if we turned this sideways? It would now push the vehicle sideways with a force of 10,000 pounds. So if we know what the pressure is and we know the area, then we can figure out how much is it pushing. And that's what I'm talking about here is it pushing. And let's see if I can get this to come out. Oh, I guess I still had it cooking. All right. Very good. So, for instance, let's take this 12 by 12. Let's just say that we had a jet engine. Let's say we had a square, whoops, let's say we had a square jet engine. That's going to make it easier. We'll use red this time. Let's say we have a square jet engine, and that exhaust pipe is 12 inches by 12 inches. And here's our jet engine. And the air is coming in the tailpipe, and then the air is going out the tailpipe. And the pressure out in front of the engine is 15 pounds per square inch. That's, you don't have to write this down, but that's normal pressure at sea level on an average day. It's really 14.7, but we're going to say that it's 15. So if you drive to Morro Bay or Pismo Beach and you get out a barometer and you measure the air pressure, it's going to be just a little bit less than 15 PSI. That's not very much. When we blow it out the tailpipe of this jet engine, let's just say we're going to blow it out the tailpipe at 35 PSI. So if, if here's the intake and we're pulling air in and the exhaust, the air is higher pressure, which way is this engine going to get pushed? Which way? Yeah, that way. Yeah, to the right on this diagram. It's going to get pushed to the right. So this isn't because we sped the air up. This is because the pressure inside the tailpipe is higher. And we got to take that into account. So the second way to take uh, things into account... Oh, it doesn't want to erase that. Okay, all right, fine. is the area of the exhaust times the change or difference in pressure. So we could calculate if we wanted. I'm not going to have you do this math on the quiz or the test. But we could calculate this jet engine. Okay, the force is the area times the change in pressure. So if I punch that in there, the area is 12 by 12. So what's 12 times 12? Does anybody remember? 144, that square inch, is times the change in pressure. So the pressure coming in was 15 PSI, but the pressure on the back is 35. So what's 35 minus 15? Get out your calculator, quick. 20, 144 times 20. 2 times 14 is 28, with another 8, 2, 8, 8, and put another 0 behind it. How's my math? Is my math all right? Okay. So that's going to be, if I can find it here, that's going to be pounds of force. So jet engines get thrust two different ways. You pull in some air that's going slow, and you push it out the tailpipe, and it goes fast that pushes the engine forward. The second way to get thrust is the air pressure on the front of the engine is low and the air pressure inside of the exhaust pipe is high pressure and that pushes the engine forward.
I know you're kind of going, what are you talking about, Mr. Johnson? Are you telling me this is how jet engines get thrust and they fly through the air? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Who's got the sign-up sheet? Is that floating around here somewhere? You gave it to me? Okay. Did anybody, uh, una was anybody unable to sign on her? Okay, very good. So here, so here's what I want you to, go ahead. You need on? You need on? So here's what you ought to be able to do off of this slide. So I'm, can, is it okay if I give you some practice quiz questions right now? So you can double check your notes and see if you got everything. If that's not cool, raise your hand and say, please, Mr. Johnson, don't do that. Okay. So here's questions I would ask. I would say, in one sentence, describe Newton's third law. Who doesn't have that written down? It's okay to raise your hand. We'll laugh at you for a couple of seconds, and then, you, then I'll give you the answer, right? I'm just kidding. No one will laugh at you. How many people enjoy Newton's third law of motion? All right. Is, any, is anybody into boxing or uh, ultimate fighting championship? Just think about that fist that weighs five pounds and it hits somebody at 28 miles, at 30 miles an hour. Five pounds of force times 30 miles an hour is 150 foot miles an hour of force. And then that head goes, but it's a bigger head, so it moves less. So what that means is if I have a big head and I hit your fist, your fist will move more than my head was. Shall we? Should we try that? No, you don't want me to hit your fist with my head? Okay, because I'm not going to let you hit my head with your fist. All right. So another question would be, um, what are the two methods that jet engines produce thrust? Or I could say it like this. What are the two formulas that you would have to use if you wanted to calculate how jet engines produce thrust? If I said the formulas, that's the easy part, right? Because I would write F equals M times delta V, you know, the triangle, delta V. And then I would write force equals area times delta P. Or I could say it like this. With using words, what are the two ways that jet engines generate force? And you could say force equals mass of air times the change in velocity, and force equals the exhaust area times the change in pressure. Did I lose anybody there? So there's like four questions I could get off of this page. Oh, and I forgot to tell you, these example questions, that's what's going to be, that's what's going to feel like on the test. That's one thing I like about giving quizzes before tests is because you get used to what my questions look like because I ask the test questions the same way I ask the quiz questions. So let me ask this. Is it okay if you get to see the quiz questions and you know that test questions are going to be similar, so you can get used to my questions. Is that okay? Because we could not have the quizzes and just make the test worth more. Should we do that? Should we have the test worth more, and then you don't know what my test is like until the first one? No, I'm getting two or three people don't want to do that. Okay, all right. All right. So, Hero's Alia, Alia Pile. This is the first documented jet propulsion device. First century A.D. I'm not going to ask you the dates. Man, I mean, you can write the dates down if you want. I'm not going to ask you the dates on these things, okay? Is it okay if I don't ask you the dates? Does anybody know when first century A.D. is? What year is it A.D. right now? I know it's going to be tough. Think about it for a couple of minutes. What is it? Well, I'm, I'm trying to make it easy to start with. What's the current year in A.D.? 2019 A.D. So first century is the first 100 years. So somewhere between 0 A.D. and 100 A.D. Generally speaking, what do we think happened at 0 A.D.? Well, okay, the first jet propulsion device. So there's this Greek guy. You don't have to write down Greek, but Hera was in Greece. There's something that somebody in here probably knows happened at 0 A.D. What's that? Some dude was born. Well, okay, you, can, you, you might want to refer to that person in, in other terms besides dude. That's okay. I didn't mean to uh, offend anybody there. But somebody was born right smack at the beginning of at zero. Does anybody know who that was? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christos. That's correct. 
So, you know, you ever heard of that before Christ? Yeah, I can't. What's AD stand for? After death? Okay, it's probably Latin or something that's not after death, but okay, fine. All right, so a long time ago, yes? So what Hero did, literally he put water in here and water, he put water inside here and this water got hot. This water got hot, he had a flame under it and he had a nozzle, two nozzles and the hot gases, the steam would go out and this thing would spin around. Of course, everybody back then thought it was awesome. Today we'd go, yeah, that's kind of a cool toy but my mom won't let me play with matches. But at least somebody, guess what? Those little nozzles right there they generated a higher velocity and they generated a pressure. So they were a jet propelled. This is a jet propulsion. You know, today we'd call it a toy. I think in Greece 2,000 years ago, somebody might have first thought it was magic. This is my, one of my personal favorites. Is There is documented evidence that the first gunpowder-based rockets were made in China around 1200 A.D., so that's a little over 800 years ago. Again, I'm not going to ask you the dates. Okay. So any, anybody ever, you don't have, to, don't have to say it out loud, but you could say something. Like you say, I have seen other people illegally using bottle rockets in California on the 4th of July. Because in California, bottle rockets are against the law, right? Yeah. You, did you know that in Fresno County, if you're towards the mountains on the other side of the Frank Kern Canal, you can never use gun, uh, uh, fireworks at all. And if you go past I-5, on the other side of I-5, you can't use fireworks there at all. There, it's, it's a fire danger, a fire hazard. But gunpowder and rockets were invented in China. First, I think it was like, wow, this is cool. And then they thought, you know, we can kill people with this. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm personally a fan of Leonardo da Vinci. Has anybody heard of Leonardo da Vinci? Name, name Leonardo da Vinci's most famous painting. Man, everybody's up on their art history. Okay, Mona Lisa, yeah. A thing called a chimney jack. I like this idea because he was doing it to roast a pig. And, and unless you have things against pig, roast pig's pretty fun. So this wheel right here, the hot air coming off of the fire, it would have a velocity, right? You know, it might only be going three miles an hour, but there were blades in here, like a windmill. So this thing would start to spin. The shaft would come down, there's some gears here, gears here. I don't know, they didn't have rubber pulleys back then. Maybe this thing was made out of leather. But hey, at least you've got your, your, your pig roasted evenly all the way around, and everybody knows that's important. Nobody likes, likes eating burned pig on one side and, and raw pig on the other. Has anybody ever had that? Yeah, me neither. Okay. The reason I like this so much is because this wheel in here, it's extracting energy out of the air that's blowing past it. That thing is called a turbine. You don't have to write it down yet. You will on another slide in another day or two. But this windmill that's turned sideways is a turbine. And a turbine is a set of fan blades that instead of you blowing the fan blades, rotating the fan blades to make wind, wind blows the fan blade. And now that rotating energy, you want to do something with it. In, case, in this case, I think it's very important. It's so you can evenly roast a pig. And that's, to me, that's very important. Has anybody ever roasted a pig on a spigot and you had to sit there and turn it the whole time? And you're next to the fire and it's hot? Okay, see, you wish you had a chimney jack, don't you? Yeah, okay. So when was that? Did I have a date there? I didn't have a date. Maybe I had it on the next slide. Ah, that's a good thing we don't have to know the dates. Okay, Wan Hu, I'm pretty sure it's a legend. I've read up about Wan Hu, and there, if you ever get crazy, you can put a little note on the side. There's not going to be a test question on it, but there's an old TV show. You can probably find it on YouTube called Mythbusters. If you type in Mythbusters and Chinese Rocket or Mythbusters and Wan Hu, they decided to give it a try and see if they could ha do this. And literally, they put their dummy on top of like 40 rockets and then tried to light all the rockets off. The problem is they couldn't get them all lit at the same time, so it went over and, and the, the crash dummy did not survive. But it's a legend 
at the minimum, that he attempted jet propelled, rocket propelled flight in the 1500. Here's one person's uh, uh, thinking that, okay, it pushed him straight up like that. All right, you want to, no parachute. You know, that's an e-ticket ride to, to, uh, to not living anymore. And then here's somebody else's depiction. They think maybe it was, he, was, he was bolted underneath a kite and the rockets were going to push him sideways. Either way, somebody in the 1500s, that's 500 years ago, was thinking about, hey, let's, what if we could use rockets to fly? So there's some human being on the planet that was thinking about this 500 years ago. All right. Now here's a recorded design to propel a human. Newton, when I say Newton, I'm talking about Sir Isaac Newton. You know, there's that story about an apple fell on his head and then he discovered physics. Well, that's, a, that's baloney. An apple didn't fall on his head and he was thinking about physics a long time. He didn't have to have an apple fall on his head. But Sir Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton, he got knighted by somebody in Great Britain. He designed something to where, hey, we could propel people. And here is a depiction of what he designed. We've got a fire in the bottom. We've got a big metal pot that's enclosed with water in it. It starts turning into steam because it's so hot. The steam blows out the tailpipe. Look, we've got a tailpipe. Can it accelerate air to faster than it came in? Yes. Force equals the area of the tailpipe, correction, the mass, the weight of the air or steam leaving times its velocity. And that area of the tailpipe, I bet the pressure in there is higher than in the front of this engine. So we're getting thrust that way too. Never got built. I don't know. I don't think this would work that well. I think the thing would be too heavy. But hey, somebody was thinking about it. Now, now we're talking... A gentleman named Opel, you probably don't know this, but they used to import cars from Germany by the name of Opel. And the same guy that started that car company is the same guy who built a rocket glider. So you don't have to write this part down. But does anybody remember World War I in a previous life, was it? I don't know. Okay, that, that, okay good, thanks. So in World War I, we're talking the end of the war. It was like uh, 1921 or something like that, 1920, 1919. When was World War I over? Who's a history buff here? September 11th, what? November of 19? 18, 18. All right, okay, so the U.S. only got in the war like for the last year or two because we didn't, we did, it started around 1914, and we stayed out for a couple of years. Okay, in any case, late 1900s. At the end of that war, Germany lost, right? So the winners, the winners, the Amer United States and England and France, we, we squished them. We said, you can't have a military and you can't build big flying machines with engines anymore because they didn't want Germany to build fighter planes and bombers. So guess what they did in Germany? They started making gliders. So people that wanted to fly in Germany, they didn't have airplanes. They couldn't make airplanes. They made gliders. So Opel in the 1929, oh, he built a glider. I think I got to hope I got a picture. He built rockets. He built this glider. Let's see if I can find. Uh, this actually had rockets, a bunch of them, and he stuck this rocket on a rail and launched it, and it flew. So you could argue that in 1929, a human being flew in a machine that was propelled by a jet propulsion device. Because a rocket and a squid have, are both jet propelled devices. They pull something in, and they blow it out at a higher velocity, and inside the tailpipe, it's a higher pressure. So even a squid is a jet-propelled device. So, you know, I, I like flying machines. Has anybody ever flown a glider? Anybody ever flown a glider? Okay, I've flown a glider. And, man, I've put a stick some rockets on the back end. Is he wearing a helmet? I can't. 
I think he's got a leather helmet on. I don't think that counts as a helmet. So finally, 1929. So here, you know what? Let's go back. I want to practice here. I want to make sure everybody gets it, knows what they're doing. So let's try some practice quiz questions. So here, let's try a practice quiz question. Question? Answer? Just stretching the ligaments. So what was the first jet-propelled device that anybody ever built? Heroes thingamajig. I don't know how to say it. A E A A L A P I L. You know, I I don't know. I'd have typed that in. I'd have to do a Google pronunciation, and it would tell me. So, what? Where were the first rockets invented? Does anybody not know that answer? Because if you don't, this is a good time to raise your hand. I'll tell you the answer. Okay, I guess you already know. What is significant about uh, Da Vinci's chimney jack? What does Mr. Johnson think is the most important thing about that? Well, I know, cooking a pig evenly all the way around. But what's number two? There's a, he, he, he's, he made a turbine. A turbine is just a fan that instead of you turning the fan to make a wind, the wind turns the fan, and now you can take energy off of that fan and do something with it. So I think that's the most important thing about Da Vinci's chimney jack. So was one was one who was was one who for real or a legend? Did you even write that down? Does anybody remember? I know it was like twelve minutes ago. He's a legend in my own mind. Now there's no there's no hard evidence that anybody ever strapped themselves to a rocket in China in the 1200s and tried to fly. There's just a lot of stories. So what I like about it is that somebody was thinking about flying using rockets. That's the part I like. You know, I'm not going to ask any questions about Newton. Opal's rocket glider... What's significant about Opal's rocket glider? I know, don't look at the screen. Is it on your notes? What's the big deal about Opal's rocket glider? Anybody except people in the first row? Anybody except people in the first row? What's significant? Go ahead. Uh, it was the first successful attempt, attempt at uh, eating hot dogs? No, at uh, creating a jet-propelled aircraft. Yeah, a jet-propelled aircraft. Woo-hoo-hoo. You don't have to write this down, but maybe it looks like it was probably the first time anybody had jet-propelled anything worth a human in it. I don't have any evidence that somebody had a rocket propelled something else that a human was in. But what I like is that it was the first human power, a human, it was, it was, it was the first jet-propelled flying machine or the first jet-propelled airplane that a human was in. So somebody got off the ground and flew around with a jet propulsion device. What do you think he was saying all that time? How do you say "woohoo" in German? Mm-hmm. Probably "woohoo." Does anybody speak German? I took German in junior high, but all I remember is "darf ich," <coughs> excuse me, "darf ich meine Bleistift spitzen bitte." Does anybody know what that means? Does anybody know to speak German? "Darf ich meine Bleistift spitzen bitte." It means "may I sharpen my pencil, please." Honest, it really means that. I think I could count to ten if I had to. All right, now, all right, the HE 178, man. Am I the only one that's excited about the Heinkel HE 178? It's okay if you're not. It's all right, I don't mind. Now, Opal put rockets, they were gunpowder rockets. 
Opal's, Opal's rocket glider. They were just big gunpowder rockets, just like the ones we're going to shoot off. We're going to start building a rocket maybe on Friday. Maybe we'll wait till next week. We'll see how things go. But bottle rocket rockets are made out of gunpowder. That's what Opal used. That technology had been around for, om for almost 1,000 years because the Chinese, they started building gunpowder rockets around 1200 A.D. So 800 years of rockets around. Okay. The, the jet engine, the way we know jet engines, it has a turbine in it, and it burns kerosene, and it's got a whole bunch of parts in it. The kind of engines that are on air, jet airplanes that we see flying out of Fresno, Yosemite, those jet engines didn't get invented until the 1930s, and they didn't stick it into an airplane and make it fly until 1939. So... I know, I know we got some history buffs in here, so you can help everybody out. So what was going on in 1939? And don't say my grandmother was seven years old and... Okay, it's all right if your grandmother was seven years old and milking a cow in Kansas. That's Okay, my mother was seven years old and milking a cow in Kansas. But I figured you, it might have to be your grandmother to be from 1939. Does anybody know what was going on in 1939? Does anybody remember 19, any, anybody besides me and, and Gemma? Gemma? World War II. World War II had kicked in in 1939. Germany took over Poland, and then wasn't it Czechoslovakia? And it was, Germany was going neener, neener, neener to everybody else. When did Germany invade France? Was that 39 or 40? I haven't taken, I haven't had World War II history for a long time. I can't remember if they invaded France in 39 or 40. And then, of course, they tried to invade Great Britain in 1941, but we'll, we'll talk about that later next quarter in uh, aviation history. Actually, we won't. You and Mr. Luque Montes will. But 1939, the war had already kicked in in Europe with Germany, and there's a picture of the HE-178. It was just a one-seat airplane. It only went about 400 miles an hour. It was really heavy. The jet engine wasn't that good. But they made one, and it worked, and they flew it. So I think that's terribly amazing. And what we're going to do mostly when we talk about jet engines today is history of jet engines. I don't know how much of it we're going to get through, just so you know. We're going to go and take a break here shortly. When we get done with this, we're going to do how jet engines work. And the kind of jet engines, when somebody these days says jet engine, they're not talking about a jet-propelled squid, and they're not talking about a rocket that has jet propulsion. We know better. If it's a jet, that means it's, pull, it's blowing something out the tailpipe faster than it came in. But when most people say jet engine, they're talking about jet engines that are bolted onto airplanes. So this is it. This has the kind of jet engine that we fly around today. There's a lot of improvements made since 1939, but the basic principles of how that jet engine works are identical to the basic principles of how a jet engine in a brand new Boeing 787 or a brand new Airbus works today. What I find interesting, you don't have to write this down yet because there's another slide I'll tell you to write it down, is there were two people working on these turbine engines these jet engines that had turbines inside of them, at the same time in different countries, and they didn't know that the other person was doing it. You don't have to write this down yet because it's on another slide, but a guy named Hans von Ohain was in Germany figuring out how to build a jet engine, and then there was a guy in England named Whittle, Frank Whittle, and he was figuring out how to make a jet engine at the same time. But hey, Talk late 1930s, Germany versus Great Britain. It's not like they were BFFs, right? Au contraire. On the contrary, even, even just before Germany entered the, or Great Britain entered the war, they were telling Germany, knock it off, knock it off, stop doing that. And Germany went, neener, 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 we're going to do it anyway, and you can't stop us. <laughs> I think that was the exact words in the letter. <laughs> Or is it neener, neener, neener? You think they said neener, neener, neener? Who's the, who's the history buff that would know what that letter was? Did it say neener, neener? Oh, thanks for grinning. I appreciate that. All right. So for me, for, now, now I've got to tell you, when I was, 
I'm going to give you a break here soon. You know, another, another half an hour and I'll give you a break. When I was a kid, you got to think, I, I'm, a, I'm a strange person. I know you've already figured that out, but I need to tell you a little bit about why I'm so strange. They landed on the moon just before I turned nine years old. So think about the world when I was nine years old, was coming up on nine years old. Back then, every single space launch was on every TV channel, all three of them. When I grew up in Reedley in 1969, there was 24 and 30 and 47. There was NBC, CBS, and ABC. Back then, 47 was ABC, and 30 was CBS. What's up with that? They switched. They didn't have PBS. They didn't have Fox. They didn't have HDTV, and cable hadn't been invented yet. So I'm this little eight-and-a-half-year-old kid, you know, and I'm watching Saturday morning cartoons till about 9 o'clock, and then American Bandstand comes on. And Soul Train comes on, and I think that's all boring, so I go outside and throw rocks and ride my bicycle, because that's way more fun than that other stuff. So guess what comes up on TV? They're landing on the, on the blankety-blank moon. See, I'm not saying naughty words. I'm trying hard not to say naughty words. They're landing on the blankety-blank moon. So I think this is, like, crazy awesome. So guess what happens the next summer, the summer I'm going to turn 10 in 1970? I get in a car with my mom and my three siblings. It's a 1959 Rambler station wagon. Anybody, you don't even know who American Motors or Rambler was, and that's okay. It was pink. It was a station wagon. This is before they invented SUVs. And my mom drags us four kids across the country. We end up going to see relatives. And we're in Arkansas. Anybody ever heard of Arkansas? It's on the other side of Texas. And my mom's cousin has access to an airplane, and he takes me and my mom and my older brother and me for an airplane ride. I'm just turning 10, and we go on an airplane ride, and it's like, wow. You get look out the window, you're going 100 miles an hour. I was already building model airplanes, but after that, I didn't really want to do very much else. I'm going to let you have a break here when that says 15 after. We're going to go on a 10-minute break. So then, fast forward five years, I'm just barely 15. And I'm working at Valentino's Pizzeria in Reedley, and I got my job as a dishwasher at $2.50 an hour riding my bicycle to work. And they have this thing over at the Reedley Community Center. They built that building. I don't know when, but it, it was there when I was 15. And they had a demonstration on hang gliders. And the guy that had one, he let you run with it. And if you got up to three or four miles an hour, it would make enough lift that it would lift itself up. You couldn't hang on to it, but it would go. And I met this guy. He was in his 40s. He had gray hair. And he said he had an airplane. He said he'd give me an airplane ride sometime. And I badgered him until he agreed to do it the following weekend. So I'm riding my bike. I'm 15 now, so I'm riding my bike across Reedley. It's like a mile to get to the high school. So on the way back, I stop at the library. You might not have heard at the library, but they have books. It's like things you can read where there's ink on the paper with words made out of ink. And I get this book on how to fly little airplanes, and I just devour it over that next week. And the next weekend on Saturday, we go flying. We get up in the air, and this guy lets me fly the plane. And, of course, I think I'm flying it. And that was the end. That was it. That's all I've ever, ever wanted to do is fiddle around with flying machines. So if it looks like I get all excited about the first airplane with a human that has a modern turbine engine in it, that's just me. I get it if you're not quite as excited about it as I am. It's okay. You're not me. I don't want you to be me. I already have kids. They didn't turn out like me, and I've gotten over it. They don't, they don't, they don't want to fly airplanes. Okay, I'm cool with that. But you just got to understand, what I want you to do is understand me. This is fun stuff for me. It's like, wow, man, 39, somebody finally flew an airplane with the turbine engine in. Woohoo! And it's okay if you don't say woohoo. What I like to do, I'm going to give it till 21 after on that, on that uh, clock to be back in here. I'm going to take roll at 20 minutes after, 21 minutes after on that clock on American Set Go. You can hang out here. You can cruise around in the lab if you want to. There's a restroom and a water faucet out here. If you want to go to the cafeteria, you may go to the cafeteria. I'm going to take roll at 21 after on that clock.
So the HE 178. I think that that 1939 is important. Are you getting clues on what you need to write down? Hmm, huh, hmm, huh, hmm. Anybody ever see anybody hmm, ever hmm, see hmm, the hmm, skit hmm, from hmm, Saturday hmm, night hmm, life hmm, um, about hmm, the man hmm, who hmm, between hmm, words? Hmm? Hmm, I'm hmm, not hmm, kidding. Hmm, there hmm, was hmm, uh, hmm, skit hmm, on hmm, Saturday hmm, night hmm, live. Hmm, where hmm, the hmm, people hmm, said hmm, between hmm, words. Hmm. <laughs> I, I only have about seven things I do really well, and that's one of them. I've only got six left. I've only got six left, so don't, don't expect miracles here. You're only going to get to see like one more thing. And I can't, at the moment, I can't think of it. I think, I think 1939 is significant. You don't have to draw a picture of it. There's a different picture of it. Same country, Germany. If I didn't tell you, Germany, the, co the country of Germany, the government of Germany, was funding the development of the Henkel HE 178 and Hans von Ohain, who was the guy who invented it. And the country of Germany was also funding a different aircraft manufacturer by the name of Messerschmitt. And it's okay to say Messerschmitt. Shh, there's a sh in it. Not a s, not a sh, not a, well, never mind. There's an M in it. Just be careful. There's an M in it. The ME-262. The ME-262, the reason why I think it's significant, have you ever noticed that, like, I'm the one that gets to decide what goes on the slides? I didn't really ask you, hey, what do you want to know about aviation history? Tell me, and I'll come to class with a good story. Hey, that is not a bad idea. Okay, we'll get back to that later. The gut, both of these planes were built in Germany, but the HE-178, they only built one. The Messerschmitt ME-262, which I'm going to show you a picture of, they built hundreds and hundreds of these, and this thing rocked. It had two jet engines. There, I love that picture. This thing would go 100 miles an hour faster than the fastest other airplane. So over Germany, when this thing took off, the fastest fighter plane that the Allies could put up would go about 400 miles an hour at best. And this thing would go more than 500 miles an hour. And I know you're not experts about fighter dogfighting and stuff, but if you can go 25% faster, if you can go 100 miles an hour faster, it means it's going to be way easier to shoot the other people out of the sky. And you don't have to write these two parts down. I'm not going to ask you about these two parts. But there was two reasons why this didn't make Germany win the war. Fuel. Pardon me? Fuel. fuel. You know, I, I haven't read. I, I, fuel was a problem across Germany at the end of the war. That's 100% correct. What Germany did with this airplane, specifically incorrectly, and of course, this is my opinion, but hey, I'm the one standing talking, right? I'm the one that has six more amazing things that you don't know that I can do. Is number one, the leader of the country of Germany, his name was Adolf Hitler. He told the German Air Force, don't use this to go up there and shoot the fighters out of the sky. And we're losing the war on the ground with troops and tanks. I want you to use it for ground attack. What's that? Well, it, it probably did all right as a ground attack plane, but, you know, shooting bullets and stuff. But that meant the U.S. and Great Britain, we were flying bombers over Germany, dropping bombs on top of Germany all over the place. And we sent fighters along with the bombers. So when their fighters came up, we could try to shoot them down so the bombers could keep going. If, if Germany had sent these up to shoot down our fighters, they could have then shot down our bombers, too, and what we were doing with our bombers, we were destroying all of that. We were destroying their fuel refineries, and we were destroying the places they made airplanes, and we were destroying the, the factories that made tanks, and we were destroying the factories that made, made rifles. And just to be really clear, we destroyed human beings in that war. Has anybody ever heard of the, the city of Dresden in Germany? You don't have to write this part down. 
Does anybody know what's significant about the city of Dresden in Germany? Say that again. That's where the most people died. That is correct. And that more people died, civilians, from burning and dying of smoke inhalation and being blown up by bombs. Because in Dresden, we didn't drop just regular bombs. We dropped incendiary bombs designed to blow up and catch everything on fire. We killed more people. And when I say we, I mean Great Britain and the United States. We killed more people in the city of Dresden, Germany, than we killed in Hiroshima, Japan, when when we dropped a nuclear bomb on that that city. I'm not trying to say nuclear bombs aren't that bad. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we killed a lot of people as the United States government and the Great Great Britain government. But that's a whole other rant. We can talk about that on some other day. So Germany... The leader of the country of Germany, Adolf Hitler, told the Air Force, don't use this to shoot down the bombers. He said, we're losing the ground war. So that was a mistake. And the other mistake they made was most of these airplanes were built by slave labor. In Germany during the late 1930s and during the early 1940s, Germany was taking over countries like Poland and Romania and Czechoslovakia And they would round up people and literally kidnap them by gunpoint and drag them to places and put them in a factory with a fence with barbed wire and armed guards. You work in this factory and you build this or we shoot you. So the the country of Germany was using slave labor to do a lot of things, including building the ME-262 and you tell me, somebody, somebody captures you at gunpoint, they have kidnapped you, turned you into a slave, they don't feed you well, you think you're going to do a good job building airplanes? Not if you can help it, you're not. So these things had a lot of problems. They had a lot of problems with this airplane. So that last five-minute rant, you don't have to write that down. As far as a technological advancement in aviation, this airplane's amazing. I mean, overnight, you know, people, we, we were creeping up on 400 miles an hour in our fighter, jet, fighter planes. We didn't have jets back then. When I say we, the world, the planet, you know, we hit 300 in the 1930s, 350. And then in the middle of World War II, the United States had a couple of airplanes that would just hit 400 miles an hour. I mean, that's like full power, and we can only do this for about five minutes. And if we go more than that, it'll ruin the engines. And then overnight, here comes an airplane that's not just 410 miles an hour, but it's 500 miles an hour. So creating an airplane that would fly around with a turbine engine, a turbine engine, was a huge change, a huge technological advancement. The engine inside of the ME-262 was the UMO-004. UMO is the manufacturer. Has anybody ever heard of, of pickup trucks? It's a motor vehicle commonly sold in the United States. It usually has four wheels, sometimes six. It usually has a front cab that two or three people sit in the front. Some they put, times they put an extra part in the back, and some people can sit in the back. Has anybody ever heard of a pickup truck? You ever, ever heard of a pick-em-up truck? Pick-em-up truck, that's the same as pickup truck, except it's pick-em-up. Oh, all right, fine. In some trucks in the United States, you can get like a, I don't know if it's Ford or Chevy, but you can get a Cummins diesel in it. Ford, is it Ford or Chevy? Dodge. Oh, see, this is how much I know about trucks. So you can buy a Dodge pickup truck, and Dodge made the truck, but they bought the engine from a different company. In the United States, most of the car companies, they make the car and they make the engine that goes in it. In aviation, Almost nobody that makes the airplane also makes the engine. Boeing makes the airplane, and they buy an engine from Pratt & Whitney. Airbus makes the engine. Correction, Airbus makes the airplane, and they buy engines from Rolls-Royce. So that's actually the norm, is to have one outfit making the airplane, Messerschmitt, and a different company, Umo, made the engine. So although Von Ohain and Henkel Aircraft a few years earlier made one engine and made one airplane, 
the government was paying to have that made. So all the secrets for that airplane and that engine, the government owned it. They gave it to Yumo, and Yumo started making engines. And they told Messerschmitt, here, make an airplane that will fly with that engine. And they did. And that's pretty much the way it is, even back then, is that whoever made the airplane usually buys their engines from a different company. So when I say mass-produced, when I say the word mass-produced, I mean they didn't just build one and fly it around and go, woohoo, how cool is that? They just built tens and tens or hundreds and hundreds of them or thousands of them. So there's a picture of the engine. I know you don't know what it is, but we're going to do that in another day or two. I'll be able to pull up this thing, and you'll be able to tell me what three or four components in there are. And you're going to go, yeah, that's sweet. There's a picture of one that's cut away. It it's, doesn't help you very much. Does that help you understand how jet engine works? Probably not. I just like the little, I like the colors. There's red and blue and yellow. And it's kind of a light pastel blue. And, oh, sorry. There's another cutaway. This has got the engine cowling. It's like got the hood off. So that's what the engine actually looks like. They actually... You don't have to write this down. On the front of the engine, this is a lawnmower engine. It's about a 10 horsepower lawnmower engine, and they would pull start to get this engine to run, this little 10 horsepower gas engine, and then that would spin the rest of the engine and get it started. I'm not making this up. There's some more pictures. Anybody know who won World War II? Was it Fred and Mabel? Who? The Allies. The good, the good guys or the bad guys? Well, they're the good guys because they wrote the history books. What if Germany and Italy and Japan had won the war? I guess we'd be the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, we would. We, we'd probably be in a little, doing a little more Sprechen Sie Deutsch than we do right now. But that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother rant. So the war ended. Anybody besides William? When was uh, when did, when was the World War II over? Does anybody know? I know you haven't taken that class since you were in kindergarten. Anybody except William? 1945. Okay. So Germany had three years to fly that airplane around. I, I can't remember how many they built. I don't think it was a thousand, but they wasted. They should they should have built like ten thousand of them, and shot down all of the Allied bombers, and maybe they wouldn't have lost the war. But hey, I'm not a I'm not a combat strategist. I just like flying machines that, that burn kerosene and go really fast and you get to wear helmets and sunglasses and you get to go woohoo. The Vickers Viscount. Five years after the war, I'm not gonna ask you when. You don't have to, you can cry if you wrote down nineteen fifty you can cross it out. I'm not gonna ask you nineteen fifty. But the Vickers Viscount it was the first turbine engine powered device airplane to haul passengers for pay. And I want to stop and talk about turboprops because that says turboprops. And you're going, I thought we were talking about turbine engines. What's this turboprop thing? Well, you can take a turbine engine, and there's a way, and we're going to get to it tomorrow or on Monday, where you can hook a propeller up to a turbine engine. And you don't have to write this down, but it makes it more fuel efficient. In fact, in the olden days, about 20 years ago, when they started making smaller airliners, right now we got uh, ERJs and CRJs like flying between Phoenix and Fresno or Fresno and San Francisco, and it holds about 50 people, and they got smaller jet engines. They're smaller jets. But about 20, 30 years ago, an airplane that size, they would have put a jet engine on it that had a propeller. It went slower, but it didn't burn as much fuel for the same trip. But the airlines decided they could make more money flying faster airplanes. Let's say you got two airplanes. They both hold 50 people. This one goes 500 miles an hour, and this one goes 300 miles an hour. you got to fly to L.A. It's 200 miles. And all you're going to do with that airplane is fly between Fresno and L.A. back and forth. But you can go 500 miles an hour. Let's just say it goes 400 miles an hour. Make the math easy. It takes about an hour to get to, uh, half an hour to get to L.A., right? It's 200 miles. It goes 400 miles in an hour. So in a half of an hour, it'll go 200 miles. So in a half an hour, I can get there, unload people, put more people back on, get rid of their luggage, get somebody else's luggage, drain the toilets, put, put some fuel on board, put some more peanuts on board, 
Zoom. An hour later, it takes off. It comes here to Fresno. So we do this all day from 6 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night. We take another airplane. Let's just say it goes 200 miles an hour. It takes a whole hour to get there. Burns, burns about 20, 30% less gas, less jet fuel. But it takes an hour to get there. How many of those flights can we do in the propeller-driven plane compared to the jet plane? Which one can we get more flights in? The one that goes faster or the one that goes slower? The one that goes faster. So I'm going to make up some numbers. So what if the jet-propelled airplane that goes four or 500 miles an hour, what if we can get five, what if we can get four round trips there and back, there and back, there and back, four times, but the propeller-driven airplane, we can only get three round trips, and we charge the same amount of money. We make the same amount of money. If you're an airline, which kind of airplane do you want? You want the slow, fuel-efficient, or you want the fast one that you can have a lot of flights per day? You get the one that will burn more fuel, but you can get more flights in per day. So you jack the price up a little bit, and you're, still, you're, you're making more money. So you don't see a lot of propeller-driven jets in service anymore because the airlines figured out we're going to we need to make money we got to do a lot of flights per day it's like mcdonald's do you want to sell a thousand hamburgers a day or do you want to sell ten that cost more or do you want to sell ten thousand hamburgers a day how many people want to grow up and own a mcdonald's the only thing about mcdonald's you could make a lot of money but you're feeding people food how much vegetable is in ketchup anyway i know you get two slices of pickle right on a, on a cheeseburger don't you get two slices of pickle? I don't. Does ketchup count as a as a vegetable? Do your parents let you count ke ketchup? It's made out. It's made out of red stuff. I don't know. Is it made out of tomatoes? How about mustard? That's ground mustard seed, right? Your parents let you count mustard as a vegetable. Do your parents even make you eat vegetables? Has the world changed that? Your parents don't make you eat vegetables. Man, the world has changed a lot. When I was a kid, all they had was vegetables. We didn't even have... Oh, never mind. So here's a picture of a Vickers Viscount. It actually has two engines on each side. It's actually a four-engined airplane. I actually... This is true. I was 17 or 18 years old, and I was going to school in L.A. Anybody ever heard, heard of L.A.? It's everything south of Bakersfield. That's, when I was a kid, if it was south of Bakersfield, we called it L.A. I went to a school in Riverside, and a friend of mine I met there, he liked airplanes. We'd go to airports and just walk around. This is the old days, before 9-11 and the TSA, and you could just open a door and walk out onto the ramp of the airport. Nobody worried about it. And there was an old, old Viscount that was empty and decrepit, and we crawled around inside of it. It was great. Nobody came out there with guns and told us to stop. 1950. So was that 69 years ago? That's almost as old as I am. There's a picture of a slightly newer one, one with a better paint job on it. So it was a jet engine with propeller. So if somebody asks you, what is a turboprop? A turboprop is a jet engine that makes the propeller spin around. And then some people are going to say in the history of jet travel that the de Havilland Comet might be the most important airplane. Because it was a regular jet. It didn't have a propeller on it. Sucked air in the front, blew it out the back, burned kerosene, made a lot of noise, went 500 miles an hour. It was a real, typical, what we would look at it today and, and say, yeah, that's a jet airliner. Here's a picture of it. That one's all shiny, polished aluminum. Let's see if I got another picture. There we go. It's kind of weird for today because this stuck the engines inside the wings. Nobody does that anymore. Uh, but this thing would go more than 500 miles an hour. When this thing went into service, except for the Vickers Viscount, this thing was going 500 miles an hour or more. A typical airliner was going about 200 miles an hour before World War II kicked in. If you had an airliner that went 200 miles an hour, you were in a fast airliner. The war gets out seven years later. This thing's going 500 miles an hour, about twice as fast as the airliners had gone. But you also got to remember, back then, you couldn't go flying unless you were loaded. And when I say loaded, I mean a lot of money. And it was like a really big deal. You actually got dressed up. Now you get on an airliner, and people are wearing T-shirts and jeans and flip-flops, and they got headphones in their ears, and they're playing games on their iPad. And that's just the old people like me. 
Has anybody worn flip-flops? I've never worn flip-flops on an airliner. I'm just kidding. I, we're getting really close to the end here. Most people think that the Concorde was the one and the only supersonic transport uh, passenger jet. But before the Concorde, what was back then the Soviet Union, TU-144 Tupolev. Tupolev is the name of them. It's like Boeing. In the United States, we got Boeing. In the Soviet Union, it's rushing out. They got Tupolev. They built a supersonic jet that would go 2,000 miles an hour. And it flew a few times in service, and they crashed one, and they went, ah, and then they stopped flying it. Has anybody ever been in an aircraft crash, and you went, ah? Has anybody ever been in an airplane, and you went, ah, and it didn't crash? The, the current life, Hema? Hema? Current life, yeah. Can you describe your experience? Is it too personal? If you relive it, will you cry? You ordered nachos on the airplane? Cool, they'd let you order nachos? Wow, okay, keep going. You weren't ready? The nachos f fell on the floor? So you weren't worried for your life. You were worried about your nachos. Yeah, I'm telling you, if your food falls on the floor of an airline carpet, do not eat it. How often do they shampoo the carpets? Once every 25 years. I'm just kidding. I don't know how often they shampoo the carpets, but they certainly don't shampoo it every night. And oh, I have to ask, though, did you go, ah, Ver out loud? Okay. Well, you could have had an emotional, oh, and not said it out loud. No, I said it out loud. Okay. All right. It woke you up. Yeah. Yeah. You're, 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 yeah. It bounced you around and you went, oh. That time what? It was more emotional. The thought of death was more important than the loss of the nachos. I understand. Although some people have put great significance on the importance of their nachos. Is anybody in here never? I'm guessing they were cheese-based nachos. Okay. So I don't know. Can you? Is there such thing as nachos without cheese? Is that a possible? Can you? What? You could have just chips, but are they really nachos now? Okay. All right. So technically. They don't become nachos. Uh, you need to write this down for the quiz tomorrow. Chips without cheese are not considered nachos. They've got to have cheese on it. Now, what, how about processed cheese food? It's, not, it's fake cheese. Does that still count as nachos, or is that extra nacho-y? Like you go into 7-Eleven, and you squirt the melted cheese on it. Is it really cheese? Or is it just like vegetable fat with yellow dye in it, with cheese flavor added? Next time you go to the grocery store and you're looking at cheese and it says, great for nachos, read the package, and it, it won't say it's cheese. It'll say it's cheese food. Like Velveeta, you know Velveeta melts really nice, works great for nachos. Man, go read the box. Ingredients. Vegetable oil and some cheese flavor and some monosodium glutamate. But it's got cheese flavor in it. Has anybody ever had Velveeta? I think Velveeta tastes great. But it's, it's not really cheese. It's not really cheese. But is that, can you, so can you have nachos with fake cheese? I think you can still call it nachos. So here's the TU-144. It looks just like the Concorde. And you don't have to write this down, but the Concorde actually went into service. I think they built about 20 of them. Air France, a big airline in, in, in France. And uh, British Airways, a Brit big airline in, in uh, England, they both, they both bought some, about 10 apiece, and they flew them across the Atlantic because they made a big, fat, sonic boom, and it would break windows, so you couldn't do it over land. And in today's dollars, it would have been about $10,000 one way from New York to, to London or New York to France. 
but it was all first class. You got steak and lobster, and they had a miles per hour indicator in the front of the cabin and go like 2,000 miles an hour. Leather seats. They still probably didn't shampoo the carpet every night. And, but I bet you you couldn't get nachos. So maybe that was a downside. I think we're going to call that one quits or call that enough for today. So everybody's got a syllabus. So what are we going to do tomorrow at 120? Does anybody have any questions? Should I go over the last couple of slides to make sure you got all the answers? I'm really happy to go over that. It'll only take me a minute. You want me to do it? Yeah, a couple of yes. Okay. So this would be a question I would probably ask off of this slide is, uh, what's the first turbine engine powered airplane ever to fly? If you don't know what the answer is, raise your hand and I'll give you the answer right now because tomorrow during the quiz I'm not going to give you the answer. Yeah, question? No, 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 I didn't raise, say raise your hand if you had the answer. You know, so relax, man. No, raise your hand if you don't know the answer so I can make sure you have it. So another good question off of this slide would be, what was the first mass-produced, mass-produced turbine-powered aircraft? If you don't know what that answer is, this is a good time to raise your hand and say, I don't know what the first mass-produced turbine-powered aircraft is. Hey, Seuss. Oh, okay. It's the Messerschmitt ME-262. Yes. The first mass-produced turbine aircraft was the Messerschmitt ME-262. It's the middle set of words on that slide. Is this where you came in? Okay, all right. So the good news is you're going to be able to, tonight, if you want, type in John C. Johnson on YouTube, find my channel, and the very first, go to the playlists, and it'll say VROP Fall of 2019. Click on that playlist, and there'll be one video, and it'll be this one. And then if somebody said, what was the first mass-produced jet en turbine engine? Does anybody not know what that one is? The first mass-produced turbine engine? Oh, wait, there was one other question I might ask off of this one. When, what year was the first turbine-powered aircraft that, to ever fly? Not, not the first jet-powered aircraft, but the first turbine-powered aircraft. What year? This, if you don't know that answer, it's a good time to ask. I'll, get, I'll tell you what, that's the only year I'm going to ask. It's okay if I give you these hints like this, because I can shut up. I just talked really fast, and you're still writing notes, and I changed the page. I know how to do that. I can, I can get really good at that. So let's see what do we need off of this slide. There's only three things off of this slide. So the first passenger turbo prop. Do you know, if you don't know what airplane that was. So here would be a good question. What's the difference between a regular jet and a turboprop? If you don't know what the answer is to that or you didn't write it down, right now is a good time to talk. we got, we got 70 seconds left. So if I asked you what's the difference between a regular jet and a turboprop, you'd be good. What was the first passenger turbojet to go into service? If you don't know what that is. And then what was the first supersonic passenger jet to go into service? Okay, make sure you bring your notes with you tomorrow. I'm going to take roll at 120, and then I'm going to pass out the quiz. It's going to have between five and eight questions on it. You'll have between five and eight minutes to take it. Does anybody have any questions on what we're going to do tomorrow? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Did anybody bring any paperwork with you today for me to turn in? They're going to shoot me. Well, they're not going to shoot me. I don't know what they're going to do to you if you don't turn it in by Friday. I don't know if it'll be the end of the world. I'm just telling you. Paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. Well done.
Yay, thanks, Kincaid.